Nice touch. <laughs> and octopus and skull, I guess, from previous. And and this is the is the thing that really made me feel. Uh, you know, I recognize that. That's it's just a fedora with um, <laughs> a feather in it. <laughs> My parents were a little concerned about me. <laughs> um, this. This was another piece. There are only about six or seven sheets of paper in there, but they spoke volumes about, you know, who I was then and who I am. And uh, it includes you know, this random sheet with aliens. I love. I was going to go on the pictures and things. And here's a three-headed guy whose name is Tom Dick and Harry. <laughs> and I loved horror. I really thought that what my main goal in life should be would be to act in monster movies. I really thought that that is what I was going to do. It was the time I was growing up. And, um, and I loved monsters and superheroes. So here's Frankenstein dressed up as Superman. <laughs> That's, oh, I, I spoke at my high school earlier today, so I included my high school stuff. I just thought you should see it more. Um, and this is the stuff that I drew in high school. Um, this. And a lot of the pieces I had in my portfolio when I went to Parsons was uh, was done on lined paper, uh, and that's because most of the work in my portfolio I had done during class. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really it was really funny and sweet because I I was at my high school I, I grew up in Great Neck and uh, I went to Great Neck South and uh, I. They invited me to come speak there a while ago, and I was here on Long Island. I live in Brooklyn, but I was here today, and I don't want to squeeze that in. So it's been a very nostalgic day for me. And so I went to uh, to speak there, and my my science teacher was there. He came to visit, like my science teacher from 40 years ago. And uh, he's, he's, he actually kept one of my drawings from that he confiscated from me. <laughs> 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 but I'm a, a big believer in doodling and sketching. I'll get on to that later. I was really into uh, superheroes. If you know anything about comic art, this is basically a ripoff from uh, by a guy named uh, of, of a guy named Gil Kane, who was very popular in the day. I, I really thought I was going to be a comic artist. I, I thought that's that I wanted to draw Spider-Man, and and, uh, and I thought that was going to be my destiny. But I could never finish a story. They were always, I always got distracted. And uh, so, uh, so most of my pictures are really, syringe, are just one picture long, actually. And, uh, and, and so I went into illustration, so I get to that. So I was really into fantasy illustration. Um, still with a little bit of a, a morbid uh, punchline. We're always going to eat that cute little guy on the new guy. This was also part of my portfolio uh, that I brought to, um, to Parsons. It was done in ballpoint pen, which I thought was, was the greatest medium of all. Um, uh, it was apparently it was just impossible to reproduce, so I gave it up soon after I went to Parsons. And these, this is all still high school, these are lemmings. And I, it's true, this particular presentation is a little bit heavy on the stuff that I did when I was young uh, uh, in high school. Um, but it's still kind of interesting to see these, at least for me, these were, um, lemmings are sort of suicidal rodents. <laughs> and uh, I developed this, this comic with a friend of mine, John Victor, and uh, it was always a, a lemming on the edge of a cliff, determined not to jump, but one way or another he always would. Um, I also drew them as famous personalities. The entertainment of my friends in theater class. More stuff on loose leaf paper, and then to Parsons. So I went to Parsons School of Design, and um, you might have noticed so far that, that everything, that there's no color 
that all my stuff is pretty much in black and white. And that's because um, I'm technically, I'm colorblind, which is not to say that my world is black and white, but that I have color confusion. So certain shades of red and green kind of throw me. And, um, and so I was terrified of color for, for a long time. Uh, and I, for a guy that went to art school, I didn't do a hell of a lot of, uh, of painting. Um, this, this is, uh, by the way, the assignment was do an emotional self-portrait. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all of the artists in the audience will recognize the terror of the blank page. Uh, this is a painting, a very brown painting, which is how I sort of got into the kind of work I do. It's very monochromatic, which, which happened to suit my sensibility, my aesthetic, because I've always been drawn, as you will see, to uh, to illustration and art from the past. This was a paleontology convention. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got out of Parsons. And it was, what, 1980. And it was really when the personal computer just came about. And there were tons of, uh, of uh, computer magazines that were desperate for illustrations. So it was sort of a good time to be breaking into the editorial market. It was a little challenging, though, because you know, how do you keep these articles, how do you illustrate articles that are about computers and software and, and hardware and everything else? So, you know, I had to just find imagery, uh, sometimes fun, sometimes not, that would kind of juice things up. And in fact, that sort of became my uh, the challenge all through my career, and, and I think that's a challenge for any illustrator is to find a way to make this, to solve the problem, but keep it interesting for yourself, keep it interesting and fun. That's really, that's really the key. Um, this was uh, an article from GQ Magazine. It was, um, if you notice the hole in the guillotine, this was for the crime of adultery. <laughs> 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 Um, this was uh, just about creativity on the computer. As you can see, I just drew a computer so beautiful. <laughs> you can reach out and touch it. It looks like a marshmallow. <laughs> and lots and lots and lots of business magazines. I drew so many businessmen, so many uh, people in the workplace. It was very difficult. But you know, even here, I, I, I kind of gave it a sort of an antiquated feel. This was, I don't know, I felt comfortable with this stuff and some stuff that I enjoyed drawing. Every time it took place in, in my time, I, I just had uh, such difficulty having fun with it. So I started to, you know, sometimes I would, I would do costume stuff as much as I could. And um, this is a little bit of, well, mythology was another thing that I drew upon, mythology and fairy tales. Uh, this was an article about um, hangovers. I had a great time. It was called The Wrath of Grapes. <laughs> and actually, it looked exactly like Dean Salvadori at Parsons School of Design, who ended up becoming a, um, a vintner. <laughs> and uh, and animals. I started. I mean, I always loved animals. I um, I grew up. I had lots of pets. Way too many pets for a normal teenager. Um, and, uh, and I worked in a pet shop, so I had a little bit of an obsession with them. I loved to draw them. And uh, and they were. I found a good way to uh, to find. Uh, to find a fun solution for an otherwise maybe dull assignment. This had to do with bureaucracy in the workplace. Uh, this was for, this is still fairly early work in my editorial career. Uh, this was for New York Magazine, How to Leave Your Psychiatrist. <laughs> Um, 
this a little bit, a group of images about my influences. And I love Looney Tunes. I love Bugs Bunny. I couldn't stand, this is being taped, isn't it? Yes. That's I couldn't stand Walt Disney. I really didn't like uh, Mickey Mouse. Um, because to me, there was nothing there. There was no personality there. I mean, if I were to ask one of you to describe Mickey Mouse for me, I really, I don't think you could. He's, he smiles. Oh. <laughs> but Bugs, he was a real full-on personality. He was, he was smart, he was clever, he was sardonic, sarcastic. Um, but he suffered, or he, he was, you know, sometimes the underdog, sometimes he was in charge. He was really a full-fledged character. Also written for adults. Um, these were shorts that appeared before uh, movies uh, back in the 40s. Um, anyway, loved, uh, loved Bugs Bunny. Big influence. And in fact, you know, I almost was embarrassed when I realized years later, sort of comparing the influence of you know the work I did for Ice Age to the Warner Brothers cartoons, there's there's a there's real connective DNA there. But it's not just me, it's the animators admitted to the same thing really. Um, I love Spider-Man and I loved Harlow. This is a guy named uh, Bernie Wrightson on the right. And I thought if there was just some combination of that that I could do uh, as a career that would be wonderful. Um, this was a guy named Frank Rosetta, who uh, I'm not sure when I was introduced to him, but, but my taste in comics was decidedly, uh, it, was, it began maybe with superheroes, but then it led into uh, a real fascination, which really lined up with my morbid sensibility. I was fascinated with sort of gothic horror and science fiction and all that stuff. And, um, and Frank Rosetta was a master of that stuff. And there was something about the way he drew out of his head, clearly out of his head, but so grounded in reality. It just looked so masterful and like so much fun. I, I had every space in my attic bedroom covered with Rosetta posters. I think hoping that it would kind of seep in. Um, this is uh, this is actually one of his. This is a study for a painting that's about four by five inches, uh, which, which I'm very happy to say that I own. But it's uh, it's an, I think it's just an amazing amazing piece. This is a guy named Bernie Wrightson, and we saw his piece before. Is Bernie Wrightson? Now these guys were. They were just hitting their stride in the 70s when I was in high school. Yeah. And um, when I say these guys, I mean Bernie Wrightson, Mike Luda, and Jeff Jones. They each had a huge influence on me. And, and looking back, I think that, that influence had more, a lot to do with the fact that they used character and, uh, and, uh, and they were sort of fancy or whatever. But, but they also drew from periods of art that they loved. And although they shared a studio together and influenced each other somewhat, you can see that they had very much their own passions. Uh, Wrightson was really into uh, gothic horror and no doubt you know, 19th century work. Uh, uh, Mike Kaluta clearly loved Art Deco, although this is a very fantastic scene. Those are really Art Deco motifs. And you can see that in a lot of his work. And uh, this guy, uh, Jeff Jones, that's a very Japanese print composition. Um, you know, with all this open space, just beautiful, beautiful drawing. And um, he also had a, a love of pre-Raphaelite stuff. And all this I realized had opened a door for me in terms of the work I could be influenced by myself. Um, my great grandfather was uh, an antiquarian book dealer in England, and I never knew him. Um, but a tiny amount of his books were in a, a little room uh, in the side of our house, uh, and in the in on those shelves, I discovered one or two books that were illustrated. I was still a teenager. Um, one by. Sure, by Arthur Rackham, 
who was a very well-known children's book illustrator at the turn of the century. I'll stop for a second and tell you why I love this work so much. First of all, it's exactly the technique that I've always emulated and copied, which is watercolor and paint. Um, but what is so amazing about him, and I think this piece is a perfect representation of that, is that his figure, this figure is is so realistic, so informed by reality, and yet it's still um, it's still beautiful and organic. It's not stiff at all. And, and it could be that this woman even posed for him in the studio. But I'm pretty sure that these guys didn't. <laughs> and they're clearly straight from his imagination. But the fact that they could all live in the same world in a convincing way, that was something, I think, looking at all the people who have influenced me so much, I realize they all have in common, and that's something that I guess, unconsciously, that's what I've always strived for in my work as well. Uh, this guy named Baby Frost, also turn of the century, great um, artist, humorous artist, who would have been a fantastic animator if somebody had gotten around to inventing animation. Um, this guy named Honoré Daumier was a French cartoonist uh, at the end of the 19th century. And, and again, somebody who drew from the roots, you know, just his characters were exaggerated, but, but not necessarily cartoony in a way that was just sort of the balloons and things. And clearly informed by reality, but still exaggerated. And in the same way, this guy T.S. Sullivan, one of the great animal caricaturists, if that is in fact a genre. He, you know, he, he just blow out proportions, but still, it's, it is, it, I'm sorry, it is a uh, caricature of a hyena and a snake, but it's really, really well informed. You know he knows how this, oh, I did it again. How, oh, butter. <laughs> how this animal is constructed. So it's exaggeration based on um, some solid research and information. This guy too, a guy named Harry Roundtree. <clears throat> By the way, back to this colorblind thing, I think I had this on my wall for a couple of years before I realized, um, that's green, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's not funny. <laughs> um, yes. uh, so anyway, I was influenced a lot by comic art and by fantasy work, and it shows up in my stuff as I move along through these. This was uh, an article, it was drawn for an article um, for Entertainment Weekly, and it was back when the idea of a musical based on a superhero was actually funny. Uh, this would have been, they, they were talking about Batman the musical. Uh, this was for uh, a, a series of covers I did for something called The Enchanted Chronicles. Fun to sort of go back to my roots in a way. And this was a poster for a, 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 a annual competition called Spectrum, which uh, was a call for entries for pieces in science fiction and fantasy done that year. Um, Kind of has everything, like like his very first drawings of mine, it's got all the things I would put up for us, like those big monsters and tentacle women and you know, um, <laughs> 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 um, this is only sort of a rough chronology of my work, but that at some point after doing um, uh, editorial illustration for uh, for many years. I uh, my my the progress of my career was very organic. I started doing small black and white drawings, and then larger ones for larger magazines, and then the same small color pieces, and then larger color pieces for better magazines. And then ultimately, I got a call from the New Yorker, and I did a couple of interior drawings for them before. Uh, an art director named Francois really invited me to submit sketches uh, for covers. And uh, this was, well, not the first one, it was one of the first few, I think. It was called Tail. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> this is called Summer Getaway. <laughs> kind of self-portrait that's me laughing at the top is my wife on the left. That's my friend Curtis, who's back to us, and his wife Jenna. So, yeah. um, this is called A New Leaf. And it's like the last few covers I, I've done for the New York. It's very much a very Brooklyn cover. In fact, this was, uh, I actually took photographic reference uh, at this vegan place near me. I showed them the finish when it was done, and they weren't very amused. <laughs> it's called Mr. A. sense of my process. Uh, starting from a doodle, which is um, quite small, uh, it was for a spring cover. I was proposing it as a spring cover. And um, God Pan has always uh, he's been used a lot to symbolize springtime. And so I wanted to do Pan playing his pipes on the street, people walking by, ignoring them. Maybe a poem there by the same Greek urn, so the coffee cup. Um, and then I did another version of him in the subway, and while I am sometimes drawn to melancholy things, I didn't think it quite suited uh, a cover about spring. So I, I put it outside with a little bit of a, a, a tree in the foreground and a, a sunny day, and that felt right. Um, and because I really, really wanted to do this cover, uh, with this kind of subject matter, I, I did what I usually do when I threw some color on the sketch and submitted it as a color sketch, uh, which was accepted. And then I went on to transfer these to watercolor paper and lay down washes, uh, light washes and deeper washes, and then light ink and deeper ink, uh, until getting to the uh, finished piece, which is called Pen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is called Through the Park, James. <laughs> this is a rejected cover that I always wanted to do. It's a Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, actually, I think it was. It was the title was, Go On, Open It. <laughs> <laughs> this was this uh, Halloween. I know, it's really cute. Uh, the Halloween cover. Uh, that, that, that they didn't accept. I'm sorry they didn't. I thought this was uh, signed up. It's not as blurry as it looks here. <laughs> Was also uh, not accepted as a cover, and I don't usually do. I don't usually go to finish. I'm very lazy, really, and uh, I don't usually go to a finish until I. I'm pretty certain it has a home. But uh, this one I liked a lot, and I, and, uh, I did go ahead and, and do it. It's called Crocodile Tears. <laughs> That's darling. Our dog. Our dearly departed pit bull. And she was the greatest. She really was a beautiful dog and, and uh, hilarious looking, as you can see, in a, a human, living, breathing cartoon. Uh, and I've put her in a lot of pictures. Um, actually, I think I only have this one. Um, but you can't quite tell it's me, but that's a self portrait. And uh, this is my coffee shop from the corner. If you went up that street, um, up the block, on the left side, um, and it's called Stay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a 
Henry is an idiot. <laughs> but we love him. He's a black, nervous black lab mix. But again, this is a very Brooklyn cover called Tag Set. <laughs> oh, and uh, and Darla made a cameo. Aww. <laughs> this is called the Beach Bum. <laughs> and uh, I think I hold the distinction of having one of the uh, only two covers for the New Yorker with a. Uh, I, that was a step around the <laughs> yeah. uh, Derriere, as it were. Um, speaking of Derriere's. This is uh, a poster for a Broadway show called, as you can see, Something Rotten. Um, this, uh, this was pretty an um, amazing thing. I did that last year, and I've never, no piece of mine has ever been used to the extent that these guys use it. It was, it was all over the place. Taxi cabs, newspapers, magazines, plastered the airports with it. Um, uh, I had done it knowing that they would want to get as much possible out of this piece. I actually created it in two layers, which I combined digitally. And that is these figures on the stage, and the rats, and this, and the stage itself, I did separately. And then I designed a background that we could see everything perfectly true, but could also live on its own, which it did, oh, I was reposing. I kept trying to figure out how these two guys could sort of pose across from each other and just couldn't make it work. <clears throat> but still, I look great in tights. <laughs> um, so this is it. This is the front row of the same picture, kind of cut out and used uh, for the biggest billboard I have ever seen uh, in Times Square. It's, it's, uh, it's electronic, and so it revolves with, uh, with three other images, I think. But, uh, that, that is the biggest I've ever seen my work reproduced. <laughs> um, this was for a collection of artwork for a book called Visions. It was artwork about Star Wars by people who who didn't work on Star Wars, but you know, did you have something to say about it? Frankly, I was always a Star Trek fan. Full disclosure, but. Um, <laughs> But I did do the piece anyway, and uh, it's probably, I think it's the most popular piece I've, I've ever done. I get a lot of, a lot of calls for prints and stuff, but it's called Easy Being Green It Is Not. <laughs> Jabba the Husband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the adorable, slug-like, blonde kiss. That's my end goal. <laughs> Um, I did for a television commercial 
I had to, they asked me to do five of the cutest characters I could come up with, just like sickeningly cute. And, uh, and this is how they used it.
this was uh, a drawing I did for uh, uh, a story called Finn McCool, which was an Irish folk tale. Um, what's that? Oh, we don't. How much time do I have? Oh, so we got plenty of time. Talk good. So I'm going to talk. <laughs> anyway, I did. Um, I illustrated this fairy tale called uh, an Irish folk tale called Finn Cool, which was for not exactly a children's book and not exactly an animated film, but sort of, sort of a, a and something called an animatic, where the camera moves across the images and there's music and voiceover and everything. And it was it was a nice small project, but it actually involved about 150 watercolors. Not as detailed as this, but it was a lot of work. But um, a producer at Disney saw it and called to invite me to work on *The Hunchback of Notre Dame*, which um, which I did. I submitted. Uh, I did a lot of character designs for that, but really, I, you know, I think they were largely ignored, to tell you the truth. But um, ever since, I've been working in one form or another in uh, in animation. It's one of the handful of color pieces I did for that project. Um, so this sequence, I, I've done a lot of work in animation and uh, a little bit of work before I even got the call to work on Ice Age. I had worked on um, A Hunchback of Notre Dame, then uh, uh, Prince of Egypt, and then Tarzan. Then Pixar called and I did some work on Bugs Life and Finding Nemo. And one of the luckiest things for me, now looking back on it, is that I realized that I was, I was kind of let in the door for animation when they were still doing 2D work, when the idea of doing a computer-generated film was almost theoretical. I mean, I guess Lassiter is really busy working on that. that um, Technology, but the you know Toy Story was still some ways off. But then when Toy Story did arrive, it changed the landscape completely, and there was this seismic shift away from doing drawings on paper and doing traditional films, which was the bread and butter of Walt Disney Studio. And I remember in dark days visiting that studio when they were they this great rooms of, of wooden desks were black and shuddered and it was quiet and depressing and uh, we thought it was the end of 2D animation and it's still alive but it's a it's a faint heartbeat. But anyway I was uh, lucky to be able to make the transition to computer animated stuff. Did work on uh, Bugs Life as I said and, uh, and uh, uh, finally you know but and all those projects were out west in LA. And then I got a call from, um, from a guy named Jerry Davis, uh, who had called me once before, I should say, when I was working at DreamWorks. I got this call, at the time I was really busy, and I was thinking, oh, you know, I was pretty cocky, and he said, I've got the you know, Warner Brothers, and I've got these two projects that I'd like you to consider working on. One of them is, uh, is something called, uh, uh, And he described it to him, and I was like, pass, thanks. And then he described another thing uh, that was always about, you know, it was about this kid who finds a robot, a big robot, he may be a weapon or whatever, and I was like, pass. That was the Iron Giant. <laughs> yeah, that was clever. Um, so anyway, I ended up, I got this call from the very same guy, Jerry Davis. Uh, now he's in Westchester, which is a little studio called Blue Sky, and I started this project called Ice Age or something. And would I come up and talk to him? And I did, and, um, and uh, I started working for this place. I was one of the few designers working on this movie. It was kind of a horse race. Uh, and you know, my drawings started to take hold, and I found more and more I was up there. They were asking me to do things. And, uh, and interestingly, as the characters went through the pipeline, I was starting to be able to offer advice and suggestions on how they might look like 
after the design stage, as they were being modeled, and as fur was being put on them, and as animation was getting their hands on them. So I got to experience a level of involvement for a character designer that was totally unique for me, and I'm pretty sure pretty unique for the business. Just the, the, the character designs designers weren't invited quite that far down the line. So, so in the end, you know, I had a lot of influence over the characters, more than I had on any other project. Um, and so this is, this is just a little sort of timeline, a little step through the process of creating Sid, my personal favorite from the movies. Uh, Sid was, was originally written as a giant ground sloth, which is more like a big bear-like creature from, uh, from the Ice Age, which is about 10,000 years ago. And so I went to the museum, and, and I started to draw, draw big bear-like creatures. Uh, and, you know, the process is you do the drawing to show the director, and he says, nah, nah, not really, nah, keep going, keep going. Um, and uh, so it's a natural, a natural contortion. So I'm trying to sort of find my way to figure out what he could be. Um, but I started to zero in a little bit on that head, that kind of truly sloth-like thing. Um, and, that's nice. um, and then I did this page of doodles. And I'm a really big believer in, in doodles, that, that the value of the character design is ne not necessarily how well it's rendered. But you can find something, as I have, on the, on the back of a napkin. And uh, in this case, I just did this group of me just kind of ripping on the page. And Chris Wedge, the director, looked at that when he said, I like that guy. There's something about that guy. Let's, let's see what happens with him. So I, I started to do more studies of him um, with patterns that were rejected. Um, but still, his silhouette is, is kind of there. And then I really got the hang of it more, and uh, how he would move, what he would look like, what his character was. Um, this was, and yeah, there's, this, there's a front two now, but he wasn't, it wasn't a given. That was, you know, a big feature for him. <laughs> and that's a song. Um, and this is Sid. He's so beautiful. <laughs> but you know, I put this image up here because I think, you know, nothing, as my friend Wade says, nothing in animation comes for free. Absolutely everything is, a, is the result of a debate, an argument, a discussion on how, what is the way to do it. You know, how, how shiny is that nose? How moist is it? How pebbled is it? How thick are the, is that texture? What's the direction of the fur? And is it wiry here? And is it shorter? And, and, and you know, what's the flow of it? And that's also stuff that I was invited to be a part of, which is really wonderful because because that is also sort of informs who that character will end up being. Um, and this is one of the uh, probably the first animation test. <laughs> And I love him because he's also sort of the heart of the tree. And then these are very early drawings of Scrat. Before we knew a thing about Scrat, I mean, Scrat was, he wasn't an afterthought, but he certainly wasn't a big deal. Um, they had this sequence, they decided to start the, the, the movie with a kind of cataclysm, and they thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny to have a little, like, mouse-like tiny characters start the whole <coughs> catastrophe. So they came into my office, Chris Wedge and a guy named Bill Frake, who ended up storyboarding that sequence, and they said, so, so what do you got for something like this? And, and I had a big bulletin board filled with drawings from, of characters of animals from the Ice Age, mostly, mostly kind of based in fact. You know, I wanted a paleontologist to be able to watch this movie and say, oh, I, I know what that is, what that is. Um, the scrap was really wholly invented. Um, his, well, somebody, somebody in the studio named him Scrap, which is squirrel and rat put together. <laughs> scrap. Um, so this is a very early one. 
these are studies to, to, just for myself and also to give the animators a sense of how he might move. <laughs> and I, for each of the characters, I would also do expression sheets. Because when you hand off a character, decisions made down the line, like how, how a mouth opens, how wide that is, um, what a frown looks like, or, or a grimace, that can really change the shape of the character, and therefore change the character itself. So, so it was great to uh, to be part of that that process. And uh, there it is. Oh. Um, and then just a few months ago, I was asked to design the uh, scrap balloon for the Thanksgiving Day parade which was an amazing uh, process and a, a super cool thing. This was, I think I, I might have done this over the phone while I was talking to you. This, like, what else are you going to do? It's, it's the scrap. It should be chasing the nut. And it should be two separate balloons. And uh, they like the design. In fact, here it is. And uh, here I am in this factory in New Jersey that is devoted to Thanksgiving Day Parade. Every, all 364 days of the year is geared towards Thanksgiving Day. They're building floats and they're making balloons and they're like, and it's like Santa's workshop in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and they're into it. They are really, there's no irony about the parade. They don't joke about parades with them. It's serious business. Um, so they, they, for all the, all the balloons this size, which are about 80 feet long, they, they make a big sculpted maquette out of clay. And so they showed it to me and to uh, our, uh, the head of the modeling department at, uh, Pars at uh, Blue Sky, her name is Vicky Sauls. And it, it was a great start, but it needed a lot of tweaking, which these things always do. And so we spent a couple of days refining it until we got it to look like the scratch should. And back and forth with uh, paintings over the model to to make sure that they got you know the colors and stripes right. And then they showed it to us. They flew us out to South Dakota of all places to this arena where they test fly the balloons. And this was the first thing we saw when we walked into the place. Just stunning, really stunning. And uh, here's a video I took. <laughs>
and there's the first character, and I believe I have a clip. Okay. 